So welcome everyone to the Australian Institute of Geoscientists Queensland Branch RPG eForum series uh, presentation. Uh, the eForum this uh, week is on declining mineral discovery rates, a uh, panel discussion with Richard Shoddy, Tim Krask and Malcolm Norris and yours truly as host. So just to introduce today's speakers, we have Richard Shoddy who is the MD of Minex Consulting and adjunct professor at UWA. Tim Krask, who's Principal Consultant at Geo Wisdom, Facilitator at Think Cafe and Thinker Events, and Malcolm Norris, MD and CEO of Sunstone Metals. Between the three of them, there's well over 100 years of experience um, and a fair bit of it with WMC, um, which is a coincidence, but uh, no doubt that experience will uh, hopefully come out today. So to get things moving along, I'd like to hand over to Richard Shoddy, who will talk about the current state of play. Thanks, Richard. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, great. Now, over the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to give a very quick snapshot of the uh, current state of play for exploration in Australia. So it's very short on words and long on charts. Uh, so uh, don't get uh, too hung up on the details. I just want to give you a general flavour of uh, where things have come from and where they're going to. Um, this is a chart uh, derived from the ABS statistics uh, on a quarterly basis showing the exploration spend in Australia by commodity. And I guess sort of the key take home message here is that you know, we've adjusted these for inflation, so they're all in constant dollars. But over the last three years, between 2016 and, uh, and the end of 2019, expression expenditures actually came out of a big trough and uh, were up by 76% overall, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Now they fell by 20% in the last quarter, which only the results of which only came out about two days ago. Uh, which sounds significant, but in the scheme of things, it's actually uh, part of the course. Uh, the first quarter of every year, going back in time memorial, is always a, a slow start. Uh, we all take our holidays, and nobody likes to work in the bush in the, in the middle of summer anyway. Uh, one of the sort of the key take takeaways from this particular slide is that uh, expenditures on gold and base metals, uh, the sexy materials, are uh, at a near all time high. If you look at the green and the yellow, Add them together and compare them to where the previous piece were. We're at a, a near all time high for, for, for Australia, so it's uh, relatively good for them. Um, you know, the cutback in expenditures overall has been in the bulk minerals, iron ore and coal in particular. If you look at uh, the number of discoveries that have been made, uh, even though we're spending a lot of money, uh, we really haven't found that many discoveries. Over the last uh, 30 years or so, we find about uh, 20 or so of per year. There was uh, quite a boom in the, in the bulk minerals, iron, ore, and coal in, in the early 2000s. And uh, in the last 20 years, they accounted for nearly half of all the discoveries made in Australia. So uh, our friends in Queensland and WA have done a lot to uh, add to the inventory of metal that we have. In terms of uh, gold and base metals, which I said is at an all-time high in terms of exploration spend, you can see that uh, for the last 20 years, so the green and the yellow, and it's at, uh, pretty much flatlined at around about seven or eight uh, discoveries per year. And I guess that'll be the topic of discussion today. Is that how come we spend so much money, we don't find all that much for it. Um, one thing I always make comment in my charts, which you should always remember is that uh, although it shows a quite a significant drop off in the last three or four years, you need to remember that uh, it does take time for people to um, report their discoveries and draw them out properly and understand what the reality of what these are. So whenever you look at an analysis of uh, recent discoveries, you should always uh, take them with a pinch of salt and, uh, and adjust them for the fact that it does take time for new discoveries to be made. That's where those grey bars are. So, uh, even when you add those in, uh, you can see that there, there's been quite a dramatic drop off in the number of discoveries being made in Australia, which is not good news. Just to sort of summarise all of that into the three components, the inputs and the outputs. Uh, the, one of the inputs is obviously exploration expenditures, which has been through a boom and a bust and a relatively high at the moment, running at about $3.2 billion a year on an annualised basis. Uh, you can see that drilling activity also follows the same sort of pattern as well. And um, uh, it's actually uh, relatively high at the moment, which is uh, good news. Uh, but the, the rate of discovery going forward uh, in recent years, even after adjusting for unreported discoveries, has been dropping off quite significantly. So uh, that is uh, sort of a key message to come from this uh, particular chart here. And I guess it's the topic of discussion today. So 
what are the causes of that and what are the remedies? Okay, uh, another topic that always comes up is uh, who made the discoveries? And, uh, if you just look at the simple chart here, it shows uh, who were made, uh, which of those uh, deposits uh, over the last 30 years were made by uh, majors, moderate or mid-tier producers, uh, small companies, uh, uh, explorers, uh, prospectors, and other, other includes things like government agencies, private companies, and some industrial companies. Normalize that to 100% just to get a better feel for what's going on. You can see very clearly from this that over the last 20 years, over 70%, over 70 of all of the discoveries have been made in Australia, were made by the junior end of town. So they're a significant factor in, in the discoveries that we have in Australia. Uh, you can get into a large debate about uh, the quality of those discoveries. They tend to be smaller in size than the companies look for typically, but you know, they still are a major force in terms of significant And uh, oops, I seem to have lost a slide here. Let me just uh, pull it up. Must be hidden there. That's what it is. Oh, here it is. You, know, you can just see this slide here, here is uh, uh, talking a little bit about uh, the, um, the uh, junior sector here in Australia. I keep track of the quarterly reports that come out and. Um, um, one thing that uh, I look at is how much money is in the bank, and I compare that against how much money is being spent in the ground on exploration and development work. How much gets spent uh, just keeping the office lights turned on, the administration, the staff costs. And also you have a little bit of money coming in from uh, bank interest and uh, government uh, subsidies and R&D credits. And other things. So uh, when you sort of net those things out, uh, you can see that uh, when the red line crosses the green line, that basically means that you have about one year worth of cash in front of you. So you can see that the industry goes through a series of booms and busts when the cash reserves get uh, run down because of difficulties in raising cash. Uh, they immediately cut back on exploration and development work. The admin costs uh, tend to be quite fixed. Uh, so that means all of the pain gets felt out in the field. So if you're not uh, during the downtimes of the cycle, uh, people just uh, stop working the field and uh, not doing expression in the field, you're not going to make discoveries. It's as simple as that. But if you look at what's happening over the last year or two, you can see that we were building up from a low base there. Um, uh, things were on the mend, but in the last quarter, Q1 2020, uh, expression expenditures overall by the junior sector dropped. And in a previous chart, which had the ABS numbers, I had um, the, the overall drop in Australia was 20%. So you can see that a lot more of the pain has been felt at the junior end of town rather than at the in the last uh, in the last, last few months. And cash reserves are an historic low, and which means that uh, expiration expenditures will, uh, unless we can actually raise more money quickly, and I guess Malcolm can talk a little bit about that from personal experience. Uh, if we if, if the junior sector doesn't start raising capital soon, uh, then they have to cut back on the production of reserves, and that's not good for the future. Anyway, that's my ten minutes of uh, introduction to what's happening inside the uh, sector. And uh, if you want information on this and other charts, uh, please go to my website. Uh, which is anyway, um, uh, do we have questions now, or do we wait till after Tim and uh, Malcolm has said their piece? Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, no, uh, it's it's all questions from now on. Um, I will uh, get the, the questions going if you bear with me a moment. So I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen, or, or should I? Oh, you've got oh, it back anyway. Yeah. Um, oops. I'd, I'd I'd like to start on, I guess, questions around. Um, the number of companies we have who are exploring. You, you pointed out in that last slide, the, the baseline expenditure on um, admin and staff, uh, basically company overheads. And we know that in Australia, at least there's quite a, there must be close to a thousand listed um, explorers and miners. Um, if you multiply that across uh, the world, uh, you're looking at multiple uh, thousands. So you're looking at, I, I'd imagine two to 3000 Listed and unlisted companies around the around the globe, and withholding costs. I guess looking at what half a million to a million dollars per company, you're looking at two to three billion dollars a year that 
doesn't go into the ground or doesn't go into discovering something. So, um, Richard, do we have too many companies? <laughs> uh, yes, we do. Um, it's, it's rather sobering to note that uh, the average uh, sort of market cap capital raisings of a junior IPO these days is the same as it was 20 years ago. But everything is so flipped and so expensive. So you can see that a lot of junior companies, when they're listing these days and, and operating these days, have a lot more start to cash than they ever were uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, which means that a lot more of their costs uh, end up being tied up in uh, or, or being used to put the lights on as opposed to being able to do it. So, yeah, uh, if you have fewer companies with the same amount of money, um, then uh, obviously uh, you would be spending more of your money in the field. So, uh, I didn't show any of the charts uh, in this particular slide, but uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of quite efficient companies uh, in the junior sector that spend probably three quarters to 80% of their their, their budgets are in field work, um, so I commend them. And there are a handful of companies who I won't name who, uh, who uh, you know, may go for six, 12 months or if not longer, not doing any field work at all. So uh, yeah, obviously there are too many companies out there or there could be an opportunity to rationalize, but uh, I'm sure Malcolm and Tim can talk about uh, how that happens and uh, how egos and companies individuals involved and stop that process from happening. And, and uh, I guess moving on to Malcolm then, um, and following on, uh, in on this, um, with so many junior explorers as well as uh, producers of all scale, um, that also leads to a lot of competition for ground. Um, does this mean that we end up with piecemeal holdings that, you know, loss of efficiencies in actual exploration and, and makes it more difficult to actually explore? Um, you, yes, you do end up with, uh, with piecemeal holdings. Um, uh, and, and you could argue that it's less effective to explore. Um, but that's not always the case. I mean, some juniors will, will hold, you know, strategically significant ground. And you can't hold, as a junior, you can't hold too much ground. Um, you know, you have a certain amount of money and, and you can't spread it too thinly. But I, I look around um, where we're exploring or where we're looking at opportunities and there's clear opportunity for consolidation in, in some areas. Um, and yeah, there may be some stumbling blocks, but it may also be actually encouraged by some of the investors as well and um, maybe that's what we'll see uh, in future that some of the investors um, drive some of these companies to to combine uh, whether it be combining under joint venture or whether it be combining at a corporate level i think there is plenty of opportunity to do that um, I, I can see many opportunities where the exploration would be more effective if there was uh, one company holding an area rather than three or four is, is uh, joint venture falling out of favour? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, there's, how do you describe a joint venture? There's so many different structures and so many different ways of doing it. Um, no, I think, I think joint venture, particularly um, between um, uh, majors and, and juniors, are extremely healthy at the moment. Um, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, and I, I think it's a really interesting evolution to look at. And it comes back to, to one of the slides that, that Richard showed where the juniors are making 71% of the discoveries. Well, that, that seemed to change a bit around 2000 or thereabouts. Um, I'd, I'd be interested whether Richard has analyzed this and maybe looked at the number of juniors that are around following that date. But, but that did coincide with a time when a lot of the majors um, essentially decided to opt out of exploration, um, cut back. Um, and that was a time when we saw many people, such as the three of us, I guess, leaving major companies and uh, entering the junior world. And um, all these major companies were, were wonderful training grounds for um, explorers and discoverers. Um, and 
I think we're seeing that in some of the very effective discoveries that have been made in juniors. I mean, particularly in the last 12 months, there's been some wonderful discoveries made in juniors. And, uh, you know, I think we're starting to see a, a, a very positive period ahead of us for many more. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, Tim, it's, it's, it's clear that the junior sector is very important to making discoveries. Um, sure. And as, as Richard mentioned and, and I alluded to, the number of companies out there, it seems to be an extraordinary number. Um, is there enough talent, both in management and technical staff, to support the number of companies that are out there? I think we see we saw a lot of um, technical staff joining the industry in the big bulk commodity push that uh, in the it lead up to the GFC. So I think uh, you know if if you're looking at total talent, a lot of that talent was in fact trained in um, in bulk commodities in iron ore um, and. Currently, we're seeing this um, this expenditure in base metals and gold. So, it's interesting as to whether that that talent is is um, is the talent that we need or um, the talent that that we need to have to going forward. There's also been an enormous amount of push, um, particularly by governments, to to refocus uh, and maybe over over. Um, Sort of promote battery metals, um, critical metals. Uh, you know, a whole uh, gamut of metals on the periodic table, um, and I think this this has created a certain amount of confusion, not not just for investors, but also within the the uh, the exploration sector itself. Um, you know, what should it be? Be looking for right now what is uh, the things going forward, and and the answer always seems to come back copper. Um, but there must be more than that. Um, there's, you know, if you've got a lot of companies, you'll get a lot of ideas and, and good exploration, particularly in, in the more frontier terrains, comes from, from good ideas. But as um, it was Richard showed very dramatically in his slide, um, it, it takes about five years to deliver a discovery, no matter what size company you are. And so having enough money and backing and also scope to gain that backing, which comes from holding uh, the ground um, and convincing investors that you've got the right ground uh, is really important. Um, and I think coming out of the current crisis that we're in, we're, we're told that probably we're going to see certainly on the retail front, the hospitality front, probably a whole lot of M&A activity. And in an environment like that, I can't see that not flowing over to the um, the mineral and e exploration uh, sector as well, um, because there will be a lot of uh, money moving through the market and being reallocated, and and people will look at all industries, not not just the ones which have been dramatically affected by the uh, by the pandemic downturn. So, um, I think we will see more M and A. Uh, I think we will see um, some of the better ideas being followed through, but you've got to have five years of money in the bank to make a discovery. And, and as uh, Richard said, you know, when then many companies are not raising enough money in the, in the outset. So they have to um, then drive certain behaviors which are not necessarily directly on the line towards discovery, which is unfortunate. If you're worried about self-preservation or, um, or getting to a point where you can raise money uh, in order to go to the next stage that doesn't give you the confidence to, to be bold, which is what we need in frontier terrains. Okay, thanks, Tim. I'd like to touch on the, on the commodities a little bit later, um, but uh, let's have a look at some of the tools that we use. Um, there are you know, a multitude of different tried and tested tools and techniques, you know, everything from basic geological mapping, geochemistry, more modern remote sensing and geophysical tools amongst a whole heap of others. Uh, do we use them correctly? Uh, do we use experts enough or are they or are poor interpretations that we do ourselves leading to uh, wasted expenditure and delays? That, that is guess... a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> a, 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 about 18 months ago, um, uh, Robbie Rowe and myself put together an animated slide that showed all of the technologies that had uh, appeared over the last 50 years. Um, and, and I guess 
all all of them have that could be applied to mineral uh, discovery have been applied to mineral discovery that doesn't mean that they've necessarily been successful and some of the ones which were held up as as the holy grail like um, um, airborne gravity uh, particularly airborne gravity gradiometers have have not resulted directly in in discovery so um, whilst we can pray for for new techniques i think a lot of it comes from a um, uh, our, maybe our, our current lack of success is is being driven by not really using the techniques which we know and very well in the right way um, i'm i'm very reluctant to to place too much emphasis on on some of the uh, inversions that i've seen both for um, uh, geophysics and geochemistry that have been used for targeting. And then um, a lot of companies then just allow the, 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 um, the external expert to even plan the whole. So I think that there needs to be a greater ownership of, of some of the, the targets that are being tested. I think there needs to be the right sort of um, uh, technology being used. I think if, if, if we can learn anything that's happening um, as a result of this pandemic is that trends that were happening before the pandemic are going to just accelerate after the pandemic. So you know, everything is going to become digital in geology. And therefore, if you can't measure it, if you can't get a number, it, it's probably going to be ignored. Now, uh, this is very dangerous in greenfield strains where there aren't the numbers. You have to go out and generate the numbers. The only, the only way of, of, of breaking through uncertainty is to do experiments and that's what we call on um, the experiments in the mineral uh, sector is what we call exploration so you have to be bold enough to try things out uh, and but you have to get your tools fit for purpose and um, uh, one example might be the overuse of airborne um, EM to find sulfide deposits when we know that a lot of the areas are, are covered terrain this this just generates a lot of false positives, and then it takes an awful long time to follow those false positives up. So uh, we must almost always check with the experts um, that, uh, that the tool we're using is fit for purpose. Otherwise, we, um, we will actually confuse ourselves rather than help ourselves. Thanks, Tim. Um, so, so Malcolm, following on from that, uh, did the old methods work because they were good, or? And it, or was it just we found all the easy things to find using the old methods? Well, I think the old methods are still being used and, um, and, and many of them are still good. But um, I, look, I, I agree with what Tim's saying. And, and when we look at how people uh, maybe throw too many uh, misdirected tools at exploration, it, it translates into additional costs that didn't need to be directed at that exploration as well. And, and that just means that the work you've done has been inefficient. So it's very much having the experience and having the right people around the table to ask the questions and to challenge the assumptions in, in, in an appropriate way to have your exploration more efficient. It's not about one tool being better than the other. They probably all have a place under various conditions. And, and you know, that, that's really down to experience, I think, and, and the environment within which you're creating targets. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I guess that leads us on to uh, search space. Um, if the undercover has been a, a catch cry for the industry and um, certainly a great way of getting research funding. Um, are, are we just, increasing our risk without properly testing our current search space? Uh, Malcolm? Um, search space, well, I guess, um, you know, there's, there's a risk trade-off in all of the components that contribute to how you decide where to explore. And um, I mean, there's search space geometrically and and deeper and there's search space in areas that are considered higher risk politically um, and you know it's, it's a case of matching the expertise of the team with 
with the search space that they elect to work in. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think uh, everywhere has to be undercover. There's many opportunities that um, are poking through at the surface. Maybe not too many in Australia, maybe less in Australia, but uh, there are others elsewhere. So it's, it's a complex matrix, and I think it's something that the teams involved in juniors really need to analyse and determine where they can be most effective and where their dollars can be spent most effectively. Which, which search space do you want to operate in? Yeah, I could step in there and say that the, the, by far the majority of gold discoveries in Africa, for example, are outcropping. And, uh, so you don't need to use sophisticated uh, exploration. You just need to have the courage to go out there and uh, walk the ground and uh, incentivize to, to appreciate what you're seeing. And the rock and hammer, of course. But, uh, <laughs> if you're um, if you're here in Australia, I mean, obviously you have to go and, uh, and uh, you need to use a range of tools to do that, and also have a good geological model to make it happen. So I think you have to be a little bit smarter to operate in Australia. But uh, the knowledge base is a lot deeper as well. So uh, it's a constant trade off. Um, you, but, you know, fresh ideas, uh, fresh targets, uh, and fresh methods always help. And, and there's a, if I can just comment there as well, I mean, there, there's a direct uh, commercial trade-off in all of this as well, that in, in some cases, and there are some clear examples where if you go to some countries um, and you elect to explore there that might be higher risk or, or might be like higher high non-technical risk or a, or a more onerous um, financial structure, uh, it relates directly to the sort of deposit that you need to find or the grade of that deposit. So it, it, it's a complex matrix and um, it, it needs constant analyzing. Yeah, look, I'd I, I just echo Malcolm's comments there. Search space is, is, is not just a, a geometry, it's, it's, it's the application of, of technology to geometries. So if you haven't got a, a valid tool for your conceptual space, then it disappears. It's, no, it's not a search space because you can't effectively look into it. Um, so technology drives search space and so new techniques when they're invented, um, going back to, to what I was talking about before, um, do lend themselves to opening up search spaces. And some of these search spaces are not deep. They just were too difficult to, to look into for um, because of uh, the nature of the geology in those in those places, um, making them in, um, unable to be to be effectively explored. Um, but moving on to the the concept of deeper and deeper, the final frontier. I I have a question. Um, that I don't know whether Richard has any um, information on this at all. We may be seeing an, an increase in in dollars and, and meters. Uh, devoted to drilling, but if we are drilling deeper holes, um, only a portion of those holes, maybe the bottom few meters, might be um, of any sort of value to us in terms of data that's relevant to our to our search space. So, um, Richard, do you have any feeling for the number of holes or the ratio of shallow holes to deep holes that's um, represented in that increase in drilling? Uh, yes, I haven't published any of this data. I've been doing it for private clients, but um, as a rough rule of thumb, they have three quarters of all of the holes drilled in Australia are less than uh, two metres deep. So uh, we've only uh, peeled off the first layer of the onion when it comes to uh, discovery in Australia. And if you go into places like the Ilgarn and go down 300, 500 metres, uh, uh, you can actually go several tens of kilometres between those types of deep holes and the Ilgarn, which as you know, very productive area. So in that space, uh, the, the search space is actually quite uh, you know, virginal or fresh uh, to get into. But, uh, drill those holes can be expensive and uh, it's, like you said, it's only the last few metres that uh, have really important information. You know, so if you're chasing gold, you can miss an ore body by 10 metres and not even know it's there. That's part of the challenge. As a rough rule of thumb, um, the average depth Drilling in Australia is increasing by about 10 metres per decade. So we are drilling progressively deeper and deeper holes in the, in, in the race to find deeper ore bodies. 
Well, uh, there'd be no uh, you know, technologies for RC drill rigs is improving over time. Uh, and there's always the, the hope that uh, you know, the technology of drill rig has been developed by, uh, by one of the CRCs out of WA uh, could, uh, could deliver a low cost solution to drill lots of holes very quickly, very cheaply. So um, that uh, there is some opportunity. I, I, I do have uh, an optimistic view on the outlook for drilling here in Australia. And uh, but yeah, we just have to drill more holes. And uh, make sure that's what we can. But you can get uh, information from strat stratigraphic holes as well. So it's not just the last thing. Yeah, there is, there is, uh, there is, you can get information out of the hole. So just to combine, I guess, both the idea of um, looking deeper and tools, and we know that uh, you guys, especially with the WMC background, know the Olympic Dam was discovered in 75 under 400 metres of cover um, on some pretty ordinary wide space geophysical data. Um, we've got infinitely better quality data now and a lot more of it. Uh, why were WMC able to make that discover, discovery all those years ago and yet we're struggling now with much better tools. Uh, I'm a, I'm well, which, are, which are the three people when you would answer that? Oh, one? Yeah. Take, <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> you probably all got a view on it. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we definitely all have a view on it. Where um, I, I, I guess from from the the, the compilations I put together for my uh, discovery science workshops, um, uh, I did look at Olympic Dam as one of the potential case studies, and. You really have to understand what was what was what would drove that, and it wasn't just um, the availability of data or the or the density of data, but it was the culture of WMC, and and we're all products of that, and and culture was identified in in the first uh, discovery science workshop as the number one uh, factor in in discovery. Uh, if you have a um, a culture where you allow people to to try out ideas, if you have, allow people to go away on study leave and and build um, libraries and, and 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 information and databases that allow um, exploration to be more effective, um, if you encourage people, if you if you have a large enough organisation that you can uh, have people working in different parts of the value chain and then move them around. So moving, moving people from mines where they see 3D geology and, and real time um, results of exploration and then back into, into, uh, into exploration again. And that happened regularly with WMC. Um, but the, 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 I mean, the key thing was, as much as anything, was, was also uh, management support. Uh, we, we mustn't forget that at, at any point, management could have pulled the plug because it was only the the tenth hole that that really confirmed that there was a a, a very large mineralized system there. And uh, more recently, BHP have shown that you know a, a hole that was drilled in the middle of a system can can sit on the shelf for years without being followed up because of a lack of understanding or a lack of um, management will or for geopolitical reasons perhaps as well. So um, in terms of uh, what, what actually caused um, uh, the discovery at Olympic Dam, I, I, would, I would put number one, the culture, but number two was um, a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift came from a systematic um, testing of um, basins in Australia for sedimentary hosted copper. If you've read the, the book on the discovery of Olympia Dam, we all know that the, the target was actually source rock for, for uh, sedimentary copper in the cover, not, um, not a, a, an actual target for mineralization uh, itself. And uh, it's, it was that getting into the right place, sometimes for all the wrong reasons, but still making the luck, which again comes from, from, a, from the right sort of um, uh, culture um, is is how these discoveries undercover are made and how new um, new search trains are opened up. Uh, yes, I'd agree with that. Uh, I guess uh, the comment there would be that uh, the geological model was wrong. I mean, the target was Australia was a strata plane deposit, not an ISOG because they didn't even know what an ISOG was at that 
that you know the underlying philosophy was that we were looking for big systems. So it was a high risk, high reward play, and uh, and you know company did give patients management did give uh, patients to drill several holes in, in in a very remote area that went down a long way. So uh, when you think about it, the ore body is seven kilometres across, and it still took ten holes to find it. And uh, Malcolm, do you have anything to add to that? Just there is the irony, and this is this is the fundamental image. Small, small people, and a bunch of bunch of small, small people. So I I'm not sure what happened there, Malcolm, but uh, your audio went uh, a bit odd there. <laughs> you might uh, try uh, muting and restarting the uh, audio or something. But um, yeah, the Dafada uh, mode kicked in there for a little while, Malcolm. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Malcolm's uh, working on that. Let's uh, have a look at. Um... <laughs> let's, let's, let's move on to the next set of questions on um, company strategy. Um, and I think we'll start here with Richard. Uh, the exploration mining industry loves a good fashion trend um, in either deposit styles or commodities or metals. Uh, more recently, the rush has been to satisfy a projected need for metals uh, used in today's battery technology. What is the true cost of changing your company strategy? Um, and is it just a cynical market mining exercise? Uh, in the case of junior companies, uh, they live and die on their ability to raise money. So you have, to have a good story to tell. Uh, and uh, the easiest way to raise money is when you're in a sexy commodity like uh, battery materials. So uh, in that sense, you know, people are my, I'm, I'm being cynical. Uh, the easiest source of uh, funds. Uh, so uh, you chase uh, the fashion of the month. Uh, I've seen this many, many times. Uh, every time you go to PDAC, you'll see a different... Uh, uh, story being told on lithium, and if it's not lithium, it's battery. So it's graphite, if it's not graphite, it's So uh, you get to see these stories. Um, the challenge, I guess, is that uh, not every dis uh, project is going to deliver a large amount of project, especially in some of these specialized materials as well. I mean, in the case of, um, let's say, uh, Rare earths, which was fashionable about uh, seven or eight years ago, and it's probably going to become fashionable again, again soon. There was over 250 projects kicking around the world, but there's probably only opportunity for about two or three new lines to get developed. So that meant that as a junior company, uh, you could easily raise money to, to work on your project and uh, transition from, from exploration to discovery and discovery to production. It's going to be fundamentally difficult to do. So you need to think a little bit about uh, how your exploration strategy lines up with your company strategy and what your game is. Is it is to keep yourself in, as an explorer or is it to actually uh, deliver some value to your shareholders in the form of a, a new mine? You need to think very carefully about that. And that's kind of what drives you back into the more traditional commodities of gold and, uh, and other base metals. And, uh, that space is a lot easier to operate and deliver uh, real, real value to I'm a little bit old school in this regard. Any comments from the others? Yeah, I think I think uh, company strategy and exploration strategy obviously do go hand in hand in the junior sector. In the in the majors, their their strategy often revolves around sustaining their existing operations, um, brownfield exploration, if you like, um, and and less focused on, on greenfield exploration. And earlier we said that, you know, back in 2000, a lot of companies started to outsource their, their uh, greenfields explorations uh, effectively to junior companies. So company size has a, has a huge impact on company strategy. Um, and uh, it may well be that it, the best thing um, might be to sell a project rather than to continue exploring it in the same way that um, uh, selling a, an operating or, or declining mine to a, to a new operator is, is equally a valuable piece of strategy um, for corporations. So um, 
it, it's, it's, it's a real interesting equation. The, the main thing that it, uh, I would want to emphasize is if, if companies want to be around for the long term, they have to support some sort of exploration. So if they're not prepared to do that themselves, they, they must find another vehicle to do it. And, um, and the vehicle, I guess, that was chosen in 2000 very much was, was you know, let's delegate this to the juniors. Um, unfortunately, shortly after that, about 2005, 2006, all the medium-sized companies uh, disappeared. The, the likes of WMC, MIM, uh, Phelps Dodge, and, and others were all gobbled up by, by bigger companies. And, uh, and so this trend to, to delegation to the juniors, I think, has, uh, was further exacerbated by that. Um, and, uh, and so that, that hasn't necessarily proven to be a good strategy, because if you look at the discovery rates, and we'll take us all the way back to, to if, you, if you like, the, um, the key focus of this uh, e-forum, is we know what is driving that down? Did, did did the the whole industry make a, uh, a left turn in the wrong into the wrong direction when when they describe, decided to grow big on the back of a uh, China driven boom uh, instead of focusing on being good at their business, which which was um, exploring, discovering, and mining ore bodies. So. Um, uh, it, it's a tricky one. We're, we're beginning to see some medium-sized companies come back through uh, through uh, their own growth um, efforts. Some through discovery, some by making uh, cast-offs of the of the majors, um, uh, uh, new discoveries or or uh, growths in their own right. Um, but a lot of these decisions at the at the big company end are made on 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 just numbers. So if you if you set a number that says, oh we have to make a discovery of 10 million tons of contained copper, then, then you're going to um, divest, as, as for example, Tech did with Carapatina, um, things which other people may take on and actually in, in a camp sense, uh, I think Oz Minerals have now pushed, pushed that number beyond 10 million tons in, in the Carapatina camp. So uh, it's how, what, what is your appetite and what is, what is your, your um, uh, I guess patience for delivery. Uh, again, large companies tend to be less patient and want to have things which are which they can bank and and start working on at, at scale, and and are not prepared to wait. So that change again, the elimination of the medium-sized company on a global scale uh, meant that a number of of deposits which were otherwise would look pretty good got got labeled as not very good which is uh, which is very different from being and uh, not profitable uh, i was lucky in the earlier part of my career in the, in the early 90s to be involved in the discovery of ernest henry uh, with geophysicist mike webb and and that's resulted in in a stream of profit now for uh, ever ever since the mine opened, you know, we're more than 25 years, and they're still going strong. In fact, the the uh, deposit is growing. Um, and so we you can it's it's very tricky one when when strategy involves time and dollars. Uh, companies make some decisions which, in retrospect, can can look odd. Whereas the companies which are small their whole lifeblood is 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 exploration success and 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 driving that is is a in, in many ways a more focused uh, opportunity for them thank you uh, uh malcolm uh well richard guess... here i'd actually argue against what uh, tim has just said uh, uh you, you can lament the, the loss of uh, a lot of the traditional majors such as uh, and others but uh, that space has been filled by a number of other companies in the, in the interim period. Uh, the ecosystem is still pretty lively and healthy, in my opinion. Um, you know, just to sort of pick a couple companies like you know, First Quantum and, and Ivanhoe have been quite successful. Uh, and those companies didn't exist uh, 10 years ago, so uh, there we go. Um, the, the, the feature I see is that if you're a really large company like BHP or Rio Tinto or Anglo, your corporate strategy drives you to find world-class tier one deposits huge. 
and by definition they're incredibly rare. If someone in the mid-tier space finds a, a, an interesting deposit, you know, like, um, like Sirius did with, uh, with, uh, with, their, with its nickel in WA, um, uh, they can make a lot of money out of those things, but they're too small a size to, to, to be that So there is a natural space for mid-tier companies to operate those medium-sized but very profitable high-margin operations. So, uh, and nature gives us those types of all bodies. So uh, I, I think there is a natural space for mid-tier companies to operate in, and uh, they've operated very successfully. So uh, that vacuum has been filled by, by a number of mid-tier companies in the last decade. This WMC left the scene. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Malcolm, I, I guess uh, just bring you back in now. Hopefully, your audio is there. Um, mm. In investing circles, we're always told not to put all our eggs in one basket and to diversify or reduce our risk. Um, is it better for an explorer, particularly a junior explorer, to diversify um, your properties and, and spend limited funds on multiple targets, or is it better to stick with one? and test it properly? Um, yeah, okay, really, a really difficult question and it's something that, that, that we uh, consider all the time. Um, I think um, part of the answer is being nimble, um, being able to make quick decisions. And I think while you may focus on one property, you've always got to have in the back of your mind at what point do you say, yes, this is, this is what we're gonna focus everything on, or maybe it's not quite shaping up and we have to look at, from a company point of view, uh, is, this, is this the right space to spend our shareholder funds on? Or should we be looking at another opportunity? And, um, you know, juniors move from opportunity to opportunity quite quickly. Um, and in some cases, it, it's, it's very well thought out. It's very proactive. Um, it's not just, you know, oh dear, I made a mistake, let's do something else. It, it's, it's actually part of the strategy of being a junior. Um, there's other ways to balance that, that risk as well. And um, I mean, in the case of Sunstone, as, as an example, um, you know, we, we were involved in a small copper project in Sweden and, and we felt that it wasn't quite the right fit for us, but it was a, right, a, a good fit for a Swedish company. But we've retained exposure to the upside and and what that does from an investor's point of view in Sunstone is that it actually limits the downside. So we have an investment there, while we can also go off and raise money to undertake exploration. So it's that, it, it's, and I think that's probably a good example of a company strategy meeting with an exploration strategy where your company can be somewhat stabilized and it enables you to be then a more effective explorer. Thanks, Mark. Um, to, I, I guess, uh, <clears throat> to follow along that theme with uh, funding, um, and I'm not sure who wants to take this one, uh, I'll, I'll put it out there. Um, access to fresh capital is tough from time to time, and, and I guess we might see that uh, in, in the next uh, six months. Um, and the best projects don't always get the funding required. Are companies raising funds allowed too much freedom to get away with too much when making claims about their projects? Uh, and is there a more efficient way of distributing funds or uh, I guess uh, without wanting to be a communist, uh, <laughs> um, a little bit more equity in, in making sure that better projects get that funding? Who'd like to uh, take that one? I'll throw in a few comments, I guess. I, I would say generally that um, good projects matched with good people, it's not just the projects, matched with good people, will attract funding through funding cycles. And, you know, we talk about commodity cycles, there's funding cycles, and it's certainly not linear. Um, trying to raise money today is completely different to what it was like a year ago or two years ago, sometimes more difficult, sometimes uh, easier. Um, and, you know, things, things have been um, reasonably difficult in recent times, and yet companies have been able to go out there and raise some large amounts of money. It's, it's the projects and it's the people um, it's the trust that is built up between investors and people involved in exploration companies. Um, it's those that have delivered previously. Um, so um, if I can speak on behalf of investors, I suppose, 
um, they look at the risk and, and, and they probably assess that it's, uh, it's lower risk to back some of those that have done it before um, and that they can trust. So I think uh, through the cycle, money is available for good projects matched with good people. To, to follow on, on the trust issue, I guess there has been a couple of um, well-reported, at least in uh, WA junior circles and MIT circles, um, a couple of operations who have had, uh, let's say, um, a challenging time due to poor due diligence and uh, poor resource calculations. Do those kind of things have real flow on effects uh, with investors in terms of wanting to get involved in projects? Oh, without doubt, I think, um, you know, whatever- In terms topic, of, sorry, in terms of the, the, the broader market, does it spook everyone? Um, yes, I, I would say that, that it, well, it, it, it probably makes people a little more cautious. Um, maybe, it, maybe it makes people look at aspects of, a, of an investment or a, or a project in more detail in, in certain areas. Um, uh, you know, maybe a consequence of this is that it improves the next um, project or it improves the next assessment of an investment. Um, the, the, the other thing, I guess, is that there's been some, yeah, the, there's been some problems. Um, but if you talk to people in the industry, sometimes those problems were well known beforehand. And uh, you sort of shake your head and wonder why people invested in them in the first place. Yeah, I might just make a, a short comment of, um, and maybe reflecting on the on the unnamed projects that uh, that you were thinking about, Peter. But um, some some of those errors um, were also made due to poor geological understanding. And if if you understand the geology of your oil body, there should be a lot less chance that you will end up with a resource figure that uh, that you can't deliver on. Um, occasionally, Mother Nature doesn't deal you a good hand, and uh, there's some classic examples of that. Um, but overall, yes, um, people do get put off, but we haven't had um, any real scandals um, since the dual code was established and its equivalents overseas. These have provided much greater certainty um, for people, for investors, and whilst there will always be um, you know the occasional shock in the in a system. Um, you know these are the things which get a lot of uh, front page space or, or space on mining news, uh, but they're not reflective of the industry standards, which are uh, which are arguably increasing all the time. I would agree with that. And, and Tim, while I've got you there, um, I guess crowdsourcing is something that is, is becoming more. Um, common both mm -hmm. in terms of funding as well as um, expertise um, or, or looking for answers uh, elsewhere. Uh, are we fooling ourselves that anyone who calls themselves a data scientist can find things we can't and that uh, going through you know, non-ASX capital raising routes the, the way to go? Um, yeah, I, I think I think there is definitely a role for for the artificial intelligence machine learning approach, but that very much depends on your your level and quality of, and relevance of data that you have uh, for the machine to actually learn from. Um, and the problem with a lot of geological data is that it's very spread out over large areas and in inconsistent densities. Um, and the, the human mind is very good at, in that environment. We're very good, for example, um, you probably grew up uh, playing, um, playing jigsaw puzzles and, and it doesn't take many pieces of the jigsaw, uh, even if you didn't know what the picture was, to get an idea of what it is by the amount of sky versus the amount of ground or, or, or particular features that are seen in, in, in various small parts. That is very hard for a, for a machine to do because as we've shown um, recently, uh, you know, facial recognition software can be fooled by simply putting a, a jagged diagonal line a la David Bowie across your forehead. 
Um, it, it, it's that when, when we have a, a system that relies on rules, and, and often those rules are actually set by human beings again, then it's questionable how much information will come out. That said though, I can't imagine um, people being able to deal with the sheer volume of data that we currently have and make use of it when we've got things like you know, 42 elements coming out of a, from every meter of core or whatever. We, we must rely on, on the technology to help us. Um, but in greenfields, I think there's still an absolute um, uh, value in there for, for good geological thinking good idea generation and, and, and the, the entrepreneurial spirit. And this brings me all the way back to, to, to the value of culture again versus the value of data. Um, and uh, whilst you'll always gather data, you have to have the right sort of culture in order to realize what you're looking at. A lot of, um, uh, of uh, false negatives have been left in the ground because of lack of confidence or lack of understanding. And some companies are, are mining the database to find those. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'll move on a bit because uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm uh, stretching the friendship here. We're, we're going a bit over time. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the, the role of governments in, in our um, processes here. Uh, in Australia, at least, um, we, we have some really good pre-competitive data coming out of the geological surveys and you know, massive data sets that have become available. Um, will more rapid access to all historical data and digital um, format have a real impact in, in the um, how we explore or are companies just forgotten how to walk into a, a library and, and look at the shelves? Malcolm, maybe that one's for you. <laughs> Um, well, having all that data available and being able to manipulate it in various GIS packages and other things is is a fantastic development, and um, uh, it's it's certainly helped the exploration effort. Um, and I think it's a logical way for government to to help um, and to attract investors. Um, or exploration companies in this case um, into their areas that they govern um, to to invest and, and to to help the help the local economy. So um, I, I think there's a there's a key role for the government to play in that. It's very important. Um, it's very good to see, and it's it's delivered some significant discoveries and some significant wealth generation. Um, but, you know, these days exploration is incredibly broad. And um, you find government involved in all different aspects. Um, part of the reason why we're spending more money exploring is because we're doing much more. And when I look now at an exploration project and look at the degree of, um, uh, of, of stakeholder interaction, environmental uh, uh, reporting requirements and all these things, they're much greater than they were before. And, and in many cases, that's very good. I'm, I'm glad we're doing it. But it, but it is more and it adds to the cost, right? So, so it's, it's a more expensive business overall um, as part of this. But government by offering, um, by offering pre-competitive data, by offering easy access to historical exploration reports um, is, is wonderful by offering good fiscal regimes. Um, and we're seeing that in a number of countries where they say, okay, what are our neighbors doing? We want to do it just a little bit better because we want these companies to come here and explore and develop the new resources. So, plenty of opportunity for for the government to play positive uh, a positive role in in attracting exploration companies to their to their areas. So, just just extending on that, I guess we, there is definitely a need for greater transparency and, and better social license. Um, but with that, of course, comes a lot of uh, red and green tape. Um, is there a real impact on our ability to make discoveries or is it just a, a minor hindrance and they can be dealt with with better planning? Well, from, from my point of view, yes, yes, there's a real impact. Um, uh, things take longer um, and, and activities cost more. Um, and as a junior, 
that that cost issue is is very serious. I guess it is as a major as well, but um, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's within their capability a little bit more. So yeah, things take longer, things cost more, so it has an impact on on discovery, on the time frame to discovery, on the cost of discovery. And we're probably seeing that in some of the macro graphs that uh, that Richard has presented previously. That's right. Yeah, I've. Uh... On average, uh, less than half of all exploration discoveries ever turn into a mine. And all those that do turn into a mine, it can be on average uh, 20 years, if not longer, for them to, to go into production. So uh, you have to be a very patient or a very optimistic investor to do that. But putting that aside, uh, you, if you find a high quality project with good margins, you know, low risk jurisdiction, you can go from discovery to production very quickly. And uh, you know, De Grossa in, in, in WA and uh, is a prime example of that one. You know, I've done only a few years ago and went into production within three years of, uh, of discovery. So uh, you can make it happen quickly if you've got the right type of people to do it. And the right type of people to do it. So, uh, you know, things are getting slower on average around the world uh, because of the additional legislation. I think it's a good thing to do, though, anyway, because we have a environmental and social responsibility. It's interesting to look at those half of the deposits that never get turned into mines. That. And obviously, tons and grade uh, economics are a key component, but uh, probably a third or so of the, dis the deposits that I've been looking at that are at the feasibility stage uh, are tied up or delayed because of fundamental problems associated with social and community issues, and environmental issues. So when you look at that, uh, you have to say, well, wouldn't the guys have known about that at the start of the exploration process? And if so, the perhaps had better likelihood of being developed as a mine. So uh, I think as explorationists, we have a responsibility of thinking carefully about, if I do find what I'm looking for, can I actually mine it? If the answer is clearly no, well then, you're better off putting the money somewhere else. So I think governments have a responsibility to, to uh, G us up on that, but uh, ultimately uh, a decision on who you explore and how you do it is, is, is a company decision, but uh, me is finding all bodies that are never going to get mined. It's a waste of money, a waste of time. Well, can, if I can just add another dimension to that, though, um, if you find something that is um, much larger and much more valuable than what you thought you might have found, I think you'll find that the environmental and social issues will be much more serious than what they <laughs> might have been otherwise, right? It's, there's, there's a direct relationship to the size of the prize and those other issues that come out of the woodwork. Exactly right. In fact, a perfect example of that would be um, the Hebel Copper Project, Copper Gold Project in Alaska. I mean, it is probably one of the hard, top half dozen gold copper deposits found in the world in the last 20 years. But because of its size and, and its issues associated with uh, affecting the, the spawning patterns of the salmon in, in that part of the world, uh, the local communities pushed back pretty hard and basically killed the project. People that are developing that dynasty actually took the reverse direction on this one. They uh, decided maybe we're better off instead of running this thing as a hundred million ton a year or operation, if we just take a higher grade operation and go for 10 or 20 million tons. Uh, you know, our environmental footprint is actually a lot, lot smaller than it was before. And, uh, and uh, we can actually uh, get acceptance from the community to make it happen. So uh, the irony is there, they've turned a larger one body into a smaller one. So uh, to make it work. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to be flexible. Uh, I'll, just before we wind up, I've got a couple of questions from uh, some of the punters out there. Um, Chris uh, asks, and I think this is probably for you, Richard, uh, what proportion of your numbers are dominated by WA? Where does Queensland fit into the picture? And do you think the exploration in initiative schemes by various states have contributed to the increase in junior exploration? And, and I guess you, if you extend that to Canada with flow through schemes and, and the like. Sure. I think I've typed in some of the answers to this one. Um, you know, obviously, WA dominates the exploration spend, and they also dominate the number of discoveries. Uh, Queensland is uh, is a distant second or third. Um, uh, they're of the order of about uh, ten to fifteen percent of the exploration spend. Um, so, in that regard, um, Queensland is uh, not pulling its weight relative to its size. Um, with regard to the exploration incentive schemes. Uh, I think they're great ideas. Uh, in addition to sort of providing you know, pre-completed data, uh, 
uh, some of the uh, investment programs involving uh, co-funded drilling programs in high-risk plays is an excellent suggestion and uh, has delivered some goods. So I'm a very strong supporter of that. With regard to flow through financing, that's definitely a Canadian thing. In various guises, it almost happened in Australia a few years ago, but it didn't quite stick. I think the economic incentives there are a little bit different. Um, I don't really want to buy into that story too much, but all of the economic studies that I've seen on this have suggested that while it's good for, for the junior companies and uh, to incentivize them to go out and do work, um, I mean, what the most efficient use of the government's money. So I'll leave it at that. I'll Thanks, Roger. <laughs> uh, question here from uh, Lynn. Um, the interaction between juniors and majors in the Patterson province, WA, seems to be an efficient way of focusing exploration in a very prospective region. In less prospective regions, this model doesn't seem as effective because the juniors are not attracting majors at JV partners. Any comments from the panelists? Yeah, that, that, that can be a, a, a difficult one. Um, some, some juniors uh, still make their money by following uh, the big uh, the big cats around and and if if uh, if a project gets established in a, a frontier terrain they often come in and uh, and wallpaper around it uh, on the basis of, of neurology this this is still a fact of life um, but in the case of the Patterson you could argue all of all of those uh, um, players were were in place prior to some of the exciting developments there uh, have your on and and uh, and winnow. So, um, in that case, they they're in a much stronger position to uh, to negotiate good win-win um, arrangements with with the larger companies. And and I think that's what has generated um, the the positive um, joint venture uh, activity there versus other regions where it's it's much more doggy dog. Yeah, I guess back to the corporate strategy as well, in the sense that uh, major companies, the BHPs and the Rios of the world, are looking for really big deposits, and uh, they're rare. So uh, when someone finds something that looks incredibly exciting and new problem solve things up like the Patterns, then uh, obviously they want to go in there and, and JV into those. But they, they only select those projects where they think there's an opportunity, a real opportunity for a, a giant or a tier one discovery to be made. So. Uh, the average uh, exploration program in the mature area of elsewhere in Australia or overseas doesn't quite have the same sex appeal to those uh, people. So, uh, if you're a junior company trying to farm out your project to a major, you've got to sell the sizzle on the project. Uh, if the sizzle isn't there, well, then you've got to look for a different partner. Maybe the mid tiers or another junior that's better well funded than you. Malcolm, do you want to comment on that? Uh yeah, I, I agree with what you've said. I think um, there's, it does look like the the partnerships in, in the Patterson seems to be seems to be working pretty well, and there's there's other examples where they're where they're working well also. Um, and and you've got to look at these things in the context of time, um, you know, different circumstances over over time. So. I agree, and there's plenty of opportunity. I'd, I'd encourage many joint ventures between juniors. I think it's a wonderful way to go because both parties parties are very hungry for discovery and arguably can do it a, a little bit faster than some of the larger companies. And uh, I think we've just got one final question from Simon Hitchman, um, probably again for Richard. Is there evidence that deposits are being found um, are at a greater depth? Uh, yes, there is. So, I mean, I, I keep a, a watching brief. Uh, this is my hobby is to collect data on discoveries around the world, and I have on 60,000 of them now. And I keep track of uh, who made them, when they were made, where they were made, and more interestingly, how and what depth they were. So, um, so in terms of the average depth of discovery, uh, particularly in places like uh, Australia, Canada, and uh, Latin America, there is a progressive move towards uh, deeper and deeper discoveries. Uh, you know, the outcropping ore bodies in Australia are pretty much all gone. Uh, you have to go to uh, frontier countries like Africa or Southeast Asia or um, you know, Mongolia to find them now. 
But uh, in Australia, we're definitely going into progressively deep. The average death of discovery these days in Australia is over 150 years. So, uh, we're, we're getting progressively deeper. Like I said before, in the case of gold in Australia, the average depth of discovery is at least 10 metres deeper every decade. Thanks, uh, Richard. Um, and uh, I definitely think we've uh, stretched the friendship now. Um, so final word, uh, Richard, I'll get you to go first. If you could change one thing or um, to improve the odds of discovery, what would it be? Well, I guess the, the question there is the odds of discovery. I think what you should be focusing on is actually creating value for your shareholders. And the best way to create value as an explorer is to actually make the big win. To make the big win, uh, you actually have to, uh, it's a high risk uh, play. You have to go with the frontiers, uh, chase uh, exciting targets that have got novel ideas. So, uh, I would, I would take the risk, big risk, big win approach to life. And uh, although that may lead to a lower probability of success, uh, and there's less chances of finding some sort of mineralization. But if you do find that mineralization, it's going to be a bonanza for you. Uh, it's going to change the world and change the shareholders. So uh, my strategy, uh, my recommendation would be, uh, uh, you know, be aggressive, uh, chase chase the, the big, uh, big uh, very audacious goals and, and look Big, big, uh, sorry, the high risk, high, big win type discoveries. Thanks very much, Tim. I might echo that a little bit. Um, I think there's a great uh, misunderstanding at the CEO um, uh, and sometimes general manager level in, in medium and larger companies the difference between risk and reward. And often we talk about de-risking projects rather than, um, than, than thinking about the rewards. And the rewards often come from uncertainty. So understanding the difference uh, and educating people and, and the market for that matter about the difference between risk and uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty is good. It, it, it creates opportunity. Risk is bad because it creates bad statistics for, for CEOs. So um, they, the, the sort of mindset that you need to to be a great discoverer is, is somewhat different to the one that you need to be a successful mining company CEO and, and trying to get that message through and, and well uh, understood is the role of every um, senior geologist in an organization and that comes again back to culture and um, you know the, the most successful companies I think in the discovery world are ones where they have uh, geologists in senior positions who who are very comfortable with the concept of uncertainty because they have to deal with it every day um, and are less focused on 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 the risk aspects and managing risk uh, for for a corporation thanks Tim and Malcolm for the last word um, I'll just make a I'll focus on the more practical side, I guess. I, I would love to see easier drilling with real-time assays and real-time mineralogical analysis. Mm. And if we could do that, um, we wouldn't waste as much money. Our decisions would be better. Fantastic. All right, thank you very, very much, gentlemen. On behalf of the AIG and all the attendees, I'd like to thank uh, Richard, Tim and Malcolm. And uh, no doubt, uh, hopefully there's a fair bit of food for thought for everyone there. Uh, until next time, uh, my name is Peter Christo. I'll see you uh, in the next meeting. <laughs>